Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Chaos. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Welcome to another episode on Living on the Edge of Chaos. You know, I'm calling this a new season. I don't really know what seasons mean, except for like I took a break in December. Uh, just for a lot of reasons and work and life, but I'm back and I've got some new guests. So I'm calling it a season. It seems more official, but some of the things I've been, I've been thinking about and I'm really gosh, so excited to actually have this first guest. She is like perfect for my segue into my thinking of where I want to take the show of, uh, you know, the title of living on the edge of chaos. And it feels like chaos more and more as the day go on, not to be like a Debbie Downer. And I, and one of the things that I keep thinking, whether it's, Working in classrooms or this podcast is the beauty to navigate chaos's story. And it's something that just keeps resonating with me time and time again. And so stories are nothing more than not just the tales we tell ourselves, but also like how we process the world. It's it's why we, you know, politicians have a story where they want us to believe. We have religion to help us figure out the why of the world. I mean, the list can go on and on. Not that we're going to go break down politics and religion. That's, that's not necessarily the goal of this podcast, but it's how we make sense of stuff. And so the goal of really this season, and I'm already getting long-winded, is to learn more about the stories of of people and humans as we navigate, whether it's AI or whatever the, the, the hot flavored button of the topic of the year is. And so with this guest, you know, to, not to, to steal the thunder from her own work of, of her, her own podcast, which I'll have her introduce here at EduCrushes. She truly is uh, one of my education crushes in terms of, I love the spirit, uh, the authenticity of her work. Uh, she's real. She's vulnerable, and I think we need more of those voices. And what I like most about it, and I'll let her introduce herself here in just a second, I swear, people, is that it's it's it doesn't feel like a dog and pony show. And and no offense to those that are that, but sometimes I feel like it becomes kind of a the hoorah to gain likes and attention. And I just every time I I, I read something, I, I listen to the podcast, I see the work, the ideas. I'm just like, yes, like it's it's real voice. And so I can't think of anybody else more perfect to kick off this season than the guest today. And so I'm talking about none other than, than Natalie Vardabasso. Did I say that? Vardabasso? Vardabasso? So, yeah, you got to kind of say it like as if you have your Italian speaking. Yeah, so yeah, I don't like have Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah, I just, I have more of the lisp and the gap between my teeth. So it doesn't, it doesn't quite roll as sharp. But Natalie, welcome to the show. Let's just start off. For those that don't know who you are and they're going to, really be happy that they know you by the end of the show. Who are you? What do you do? And what in the world do you got going on? That's <laughs> well, a lot of, that's Natalie, a lot of questions. Right there. Basso, you can call me <laughs> just Nat because most people will probably forget my name right after this. Uh, I've been in education for many years, held a lot of different roles. I started as a high school and then middle school humanities teacher, then became an instructional coach, then niche down, as the kids say, into a, an assessment leadership position where I stayed for a few years, mostly focused on supporting the community through the transition to outcomes or standards-based grading. And as of May, 2022, I took the daring leap to live into the edge of chaos and do my own thing. And I've been doing work with schools and districts across North America to support their assessment and grading practices, among other entrepreneurial pursuits. And it's ironic, your your introduction could not have been more bang on because I just wrapped the manuscript on my first book, which is called Rehumanizing Assessment Through Story. And it's for all the reasons you described, it is the most fundamental expression of our humanity. So why would we not accept that as evidence of learning in the classroom? Wow. You know, sometimes Mm -hmm. the stars do align amidst the chaos. Who knew how how perfectly lined up that was? So that's incredible. Kudos to you because writing a book is not easy at all. I have been, I have a book on like Lego robotics and uh, not to downplay that, but that was more like a, a technical guide. And that was excruciating in terms of like yeah. the steps and I've been working to try to figure out how to like get my ideas into a book uh, form. And Aaron, it's, I, I, don't I, know always how say, I always say I've been Woo. working on a book for five years. I wrote it in six months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. once I actually figured out that the only way to write a book is actually to sit your ass in a seat, excuse yeah. my language and write it and then figure out how to block off that time and be ruthless with yourself. Yeah. That's really the secret. Yeah, yeah. You got <laughs> so, you got to get in there and do it. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. uh, that's the stuff. I mean, if it just becomes a little here and there, it, it never gets done, you know. And so, I want to definitely explore that, you know. But before we do, because this is about story, and you you kind of shared your, your journey a little bit, but you know, people by now know that I'm a 
comic superhero nerd geek. I'm a Spider-Man junkie, you know. And so framing this, I'll let you kind of take whatever angle you want. You know, how how did you get to where you are now? Not necessarily like, oh, I applied and did this, but like to to the mindset of where you are. You are you are you are passionate about many things. One of those is assessments, and it's something that I mm-hmm. love. It's it's always been an issue of concern as we think about the K-12 system. Um, I think it's becoming even more and more relevant now, even in, in the scope of AI. And this this conversation, I don't want to like necessarily break down AI, but what I love mm-hmm. about AI is that it is resurfacing so many things that we have maybe ignored or glossed over or just kind of hoped it would go away. It's like resurfacing these these human issues of you know, what is the point of school? Uh, what does it mean to learn? Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, and and you have been knee deep in that work way before AI was on the frontier. But this work, mm-hmm. I think, is now kind of shaking people like, holy cow, we might actually yeah. really have to change for the first time. So either frame that as that's your superpower or a little bit of like your, your kind of origin story of like, oh. why that realm? And if you mm-hmm. want to talk about more than just this. I know there's more to you than assessment, but other yeah. things. I'm just curious so we can kind of set yeah. the stage. I there's right. layers to that. If, by nature of who I am, I think my superpower kind of cuts across everything in the sense that I would say my superpower is self-efficacy is the fancy academic term. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> the non-academic term is a term is probably like delusions of I can do whatever I put my mind to. And I just throw myself into things. And I have this mindset of I'm going to go all in and I'm completely and open, ready for failure. And I'm just going to do it. And I think that's how I've gotten to where I am. There's the saying, you know, experience Mm -hmm. comes from poor judgment. Um, But I have a mindset of just all in. Like I've ever since I can remember, people would always call me epic or intense or passionate. (laughs) Like it's just a fundamental piece of who I am. And then the assessment piece, when you kind of pair it with that mindset, I think came from, I'm also a very, very reflective person. I really Mm -hmm. enjoy time with myself and not everyone does. I spend a lot of time writing and journaling and reflecting. And like anyone else, I have demons that I think I've been trying to figure out my whole life. (laughs) And the assessment thing kind of mapped over the healing I was trying to do about why am I such a perfectionist? Why Mm -hmm. am I so scared back in the day, you know, of failure and of mistakes And when I realized that a lot of it came from my story, my origin story is this, you know, straight A student with an immigrant Italian father with crazy high standards. And I realized, oh, okay, this is where this all kind of the diagram overlaps. So that's where that happened. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I appreciate you sharing, you know, and as you were talking about your process and you're looking inwards on yourself, you know, at the time of this recording, one of your recent posts on LinkedIn, which was connected to an incredibly powerful podcast episode that you put out and link will be in the show notes but it's this idea of, of manifesting and in there i i know i had left a comment on on, on your linkedin post anyways mm-hmm. you had made this phrase which still like resonates with me i think on, on a daily basis as i think about stuff personal life but also professionally as i'm trying to think about how do we try to help people get from point a to point b because i don't think mm-hmm. anybody in education is not trying to improve i don't, I, I really yeah, I, yeah. I don't believe I that it's mm-hmm. just there's so many things going on but the statement that you had in your in, in your podcast and i'm gonna i'm just gonna read it because it's, it's so good is that our focus on external change is just a reflection of the deeper changes we know we are av- avoiding in ourselves and mm-hmm. while i know people need to listen to the podcast just from a different lens for you and it hit me on a personal level, but I'm also thinking about my job where I support teachers of school districts. And, and you have done that through your consulting and your own practice. And we can take the, I'm going to call it the surface level of AI. And mm-hmm. when I go in and we talk about this, oh, it's cheating. All the kids don't have like all that, right? It's like, to me, it's, it's like this external change is out there and it's the tech is the problem versus maybe looking back inwards going, you know, maybe I, maybe I do need to shift. Maybe I do maybe need to me. rethink how I do stuff in the <laughs> yeah. classroom. And not that what we were doing is bad. Like, I think that's sometimes a, a, a misconception too. It's like, you no, know, like AI now is, it's, it's another disruption that we mm-hmm. now have to pivot with. I know that wasn't mm. the context of your <laughs> podcast when you were sharing that. Yeah. Um, but as I think through that from the education lens, to me, that was one that kind of like gut punched me. Like, how do I help one myself? Cause I yeah. know I'm not, um, 
exempt from that. But then two, how do I help people navigate that? Cause that, that I think that change is hard, a, whether we're talking yes, personal well, yeah. or professional. <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah. It's, I've never thought it's when I, yeah, when I posted that, or when I said that on my podcast, I was talking about it through the lens of um, shifting the conversation on my podcast to something about how do we change our lives? How do we change ourselves? How do we change yeah. those things that have been plaguing us? Cause it was at the start of the new year. And I was right. like, put resolutions aside. Let's talk about manifesting. And I know I roll. It was so good. I used so to good. hate that topic and it, but it literally <laughs> changed my life. So I talk about it all the time now, but I've never thought about it through the lens of, yeah, there is so many folks in education that focus on all the things happening out here. And have this belief that if they can stop all the changes out here, everything will be great. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that the only truth and constant in life is change. Yeah. So I never thought about looking at it from that angle, right? Is are, are we willing to ask ourselves those hard questions about why am I feeling like this? I do often invite people whenever I start PD or a, a learning opportunity to say, I'm going to say things that are going to provoke you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you know right now, you're going to have some feelings. It's not my intention. I am not coming here to provoke you. Like you said, I believe everyone has the best of intentions and wants what's best for kids. And when you have those feelings, because it's going to happen, you're human. The best question you can ask for your learning is where is this coming from? Mm. Really? Yeah. Why am I feeling this way? Renee Brown often talks about, it's like the signposts research as, long, as well as that Dr. Susan uh, David. And their, like, their work has been completely fundamental on my thinking as a leader and as a person. But they talk about the most valuable thing about emotions is they are signposts for our paradigms for our beliefs for our values but again we have to be willing to spend a bit of time with ourselves and not be so busy that we can avoid all of the truths with the performative roles and lies and habits mm -hmm. that we've allowed ourselves to occupy our time yeah oh, i love that you know and i think about i've started trying to figure out 2024 and not that i need like a new year's resolution i've i've been there done that failed at that time and time again uh, but I did start up, and this is, I don't know why I decided to share this, but uh, I did start up like the 75 hard challenge, which is mm. like, for those that don't know, like you go 75 days, uh, you got to exercise twice a day for a minimum of 45 minutes. And that can be low impact. It's Oof. not like you have to like go hog wild, yeah. drink a gallon of water. You have to read 10 pages a day um, of an actual book. It can't be electronic and it has to be like a, a book where you learn from, but not like work associated and then mm -hmm. eat healthy insert kind of diet health plan here like and mm -hmm. and and no alcohol or drugs Ooh. um and so i'm oh let's see we're on it's january 26th of this recording so I'm one third of the way through and as you were talking emotions i think that's what triggered it is through this process i have time and time again been like hit with how i have compensated for mm. different emotions that i have felt um We've got some interesting things happening in Iowa in education where like my job is on the line and I find myself wanting to go to like the carb cabinet where all my chips and mm -hmm. things are, or mm -hmm. I find that craving for sugar, or I see how I want to go do certain things when I feel different emotions and not all bad, even exciting ones. And yeah. I can't, and I'm starting to find that, man, you've got some real, some real patterns here that we need to look mm -hmm. at, whether that's what you've always done or to like ignore not lean into the feelings you know i guess this is a okay. long-winded way of saying as you're as you're sharing that that i'm thinking professionally and personally i can't i'm not in a classroom i'm not managing 30 kids for eight hours or 200 kids in a day i mean i can support teachers but to pretend i understand that would not would would, would not be uh, respectful to them but what i am mm. realizing through my own personal journey of the 75 heart is like we build routines and we don't even realize we have the routines until you shake it up and oh, totally. now i'm realizing like those aren't healthy or well, our, in it our professionally whole, our whole culture. It's not yeah. even just us. Our whole culture has taught us from a very young age that it's most important that we completely shut ourselves off to emotions and feelings. Like mm. we anesthetize ourselves to them. And so we do that. We get taught to do that through all kinds of ways, working really hard productivity. But then as we get older, it becomes things like we numb through food. We numb through alcohol. Right. Um, we numb through just busyness, you know, having a full calendar, sometimes it can be exercise for people. Like it really all comes down to the mindset of like, why am I doing this? And am I allowing right. myself to feel and name the feeling? Cause they say, you know, you have to name it to tame it, but all of that just means slowing down and taking a little bit of time. And it's, it is an interesting journey to start unpacking all of that. And for me, that was like, I've told you this story where that 
that line came from and why I've come to believe it's true was a moment in December of 2021. So we were at the tail end of the pandemic, just lived through that in education. I had a full blown nervous breakdown. Like it was crisis. (laughs) Like I had come home, I was crying every day for months on end. I was drinking every day post pandemic because that's, we all kind of fell into that habit of like cocktail hour. Yeah. We're at home, (laughs) might as well make some cocktails. And so I just let these things keep festering. And then Mm. we went back to work and I was in an assessment leadership position. So I had a very high pressure, scary role, you know, we're moving through the implementation of a new grading system. And I was getting more and more and more externally focused and angry. Like I became a very negative person and I'm not a negative person. I am very optimistic. I'm very passionate and hopeful and I love fun. And I couldn't find anything good. Like mm. I had was just bitter. And my friends even were like, something is off. Like you're not yeah. even there. You're dissociated when we talk to you. And so one day I came home and I cried so hard and I called one of my good friends and colleagues and I just cried. And she, luckily she's had her own journey with mental health and therapy and all of that. So she just sprung into action and knew what to do and got me to a therapist for emergency therapy twice a week. And as we started to untangle things, I realized that all of my anger, things about my job, things about the leadership, things about my relationship, things about my family. I was pushing those just like deep and I wasn't facing what I was not doing because I wasn't speaking up for myself. I wasn't Mm. taking care of myself. I wasn't taking action on things that really are aligned with my values that I preach about, but I'm not living it. And so it took a therapist reflecting back to me, you know, this is what you need to do. This is your next step. And of course I'm like, Oh God, I can't do that. Right. But that's the only way you can have that feeling is you have to Learn to speak your truth. And she said one of the most profound things to me about how, you know, my life's journey will be to find my voice. And so for me, that's where I started to learn all of that. The more that I knocked off one piece at a time, I was like, oh, there's that feeling again. I'm thinking it's out here. What am I not saying? Mm. What am I not doing? Why is my jaw hurting? What, what words have I been swallowing? I need, to, I need to do that and confront that first before getting obsessed with what this person is doing or saying or someone on Twitter said to me. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's so... You know, as, as you're sharing that, and, and thank you for, for, for going down that route, um, you know, I think as we've tried to process, I mean, I think COVID, among many things, forced us, everybody, you had no choice, but at some point, you had to look inward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and we all had to slow down um, through unfortunate times. And I mean, I think everybody came out of that a little bit, you know, not quite the same. Um and I think through there, it is like, how do we continue to, to like lean in on ourselves in order like to, to help others? I think about like teachers in the, in the teaching profession, like they would give their lives and they, sometimes they like literally actually do to all mm-hmm. sorts of horrendous events, but they're so, they'll do anything to take care of everybody else, their kids, the families, the community, and there's not much left for them to take care of themselves. And mm-hmm. it, there's always like that. I don't know. There's an internal struggle of like, you feel selfish if you if you don't take care of yourself, but it's it's so paramount in order to do the work that we want to do. And yeah. I think that's true, not just in education. I can only speak to education because that's the world I live in, and I know there's other professions yeah. that I think would those be. Are, but... I think that it's interesting you talk about this like martyr complex because it's so alive and well in education because of its history with being women's work, and I could get into that whole yeah. rabbit hole. <laughs> but I think they're the, I think they're the same coin, just different sides. So you could mm. be someone who's frustrated at the system, frustrated at the kids, frustrated at parents frustrated at AI and spend all your time ranting and raving and becoming very negative. Or the flip side of that coin is I'm going to go to such an extreme of how everything's about everyone else. And I'm such a martyr that I'm sick, that I'm unwell, that I'm not sleeping, that I'm overweight, that I'm, you know, it's the same stuff. It's all coming from the same place. Like there's all those sayings around, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. So I get just as worried when I see a culture of extreme martyrdom as I do when I see an extremely negative culture in a school. Because I'm like, there's some people that are not doing the work here. And when people don't do the inner work, I truly believe they can't cultivate any deep, meaningful education. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're so, yeah, so spot on. And it, it resonates so much. I was reading, I just finished a book um, by Brant Menswar, Black Sheep. It's not a new book. It's been around, but there was a line in there that I think perfectly hits what we're talking about in, in that book. I mean, he talks about celebrating being the black sheep and not in the sense of mm-hmm. what you're talking about being a martyr, but in the sense of like, who are you? Um, and he kind of flips it. It's 
kind of opposite of how I think about what we do in education. He he talks about you have to focus on the what before you can establish the why, which is complete opposite right. of education, mm. right? We'll spend five years developing the why <laughs> before we figure out how we're actually going to do it. But the line that I, I that sits in my head too is that he says, finding purpose isn't a discovery, it's a choice. And mm. I think that changes so much and it resonates a lot with what you're saying. Like we can't, maybe, we're not just waiting on it, right? So we wait to discover the purpose we keep doing what we're doing uh versus Mm. like what's the choice how are we actually going to pivot whether that's personal or professional and so um Mm. i bring that up because actually as you're talking i I didn't man one again congrats on the book i didn't know that but (laughs) as you're thinking about that and stuff that you're sharing and you don't have to answer this question we Mm -hmm. can cut this out like because you like leaned in and you had some ahas with yourself Mm-hmm. Do you think like the net result was that you were able to sit down and finally write that book after five? Like, Absolutely. because there was clarity. Like, I mean, I think yeah. like, it's like, yeah, we got to carve time, oh. but you, you, you knew that five years. Like, I think I mean, you your, realize your body really quickly, of work is huge. when you have these aha moments that like all of it is me, like literally it all resides in here. Like the book, the reason I couldn't write it was I was allowing myself all these loops in my head and mm. overthinking to think, to think, to have a plan, to make a plan for a plan, to have a plan about the plan. Everything's always in motion. And then you realize the secret in life is just taking action as imperfect as it is, but you have to consistently show up day after day and keep taking action. Like the 75 hard, I'm sure when you went into it, you recognized it's not just about doing it for 75 days and be like, woohoo, I'm going to put up a poster or a plaque. Like right, I did it. Right, yeah. You're building a habit. Three yeah. months is sufficient time to build, you know, a solid habit. And you're going to want to keep working out because it felt so good. You're going to want to maybe avoid alcohol because you had such mental clarity. Yeah. Um, it's just about taking consistent action as hard as it is, as messy as it is, as much as we don't want to. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I feel like once I started getting into that space, I was like, all right, what's working? What's not? Well, you're writing the book writing every night at 6 p.m. <laughs> I put air quotes on that. When your day is done and your brain is full and you're overwhelmed and you've already had a glass of wine. Yeah. And then you got no ideas coming to you. Hmm. Right. Like think through that, Nat. Why is it yeah. not working? Right. And so I was like, okay, let's you have, you start thinking more like a scientist. You're like, well, where else could I write? And I was like, well, maybe midday. Nope. Things come up. Things come on my calendar. Don't get it done. I was like, when would I have the most uninterrupted time and the most open, free mindset for ideas to flow? 6 a.m. It's got to be right when my alarm wakes up, I run to the couch, I open up my computer, I type hard for like one hour, just like stream of consciousness, I close it and then I start my day. Like that was the only way I got through right. it. And now that I've done that, I'm onto a fiction project because I'm like, yeah. it makes you, it's energizing. You're like, if I could do that, why can't I write a fiction book? Let's do it. And then I swear when you declare things, the universe answers. Yeah. So the publisher of my education book, I recently was in Arkansas, had met the head of publishing and he just asked a question like, what are, like, what's your creative passion? Like, what's something you've always wanted to do, but haven't done? I'm like, it's a great question. I want to write a fiction book. He's like, let me send an email before you know it. I got a meeting with an agent. Like, oh wow, you just declare it and then you take the steps and you just start taking action and you mess up, you get feedback, but it's, it's the, it's life. Like that's really the secret of being alive and being in a state of mental health. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I love that so much. And you know, like, you know, you're talking about that, that writing, it's, 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 it's building a habit, you know, I mean, we could talk about Atomic Habits by James Clear, mm-hmm. probably mm-hmm. one of the most Love referenced it. books ever <laughs> for a reason. But, you know, I mean, yeah. I think about even the 75 hard, like the first day that I had to read 10 pages, like I read all, like it, it is part of my job and being, but to mm-hmm. actually like read something that was like a tangible book that has been a while um, and not like a work related book um Mm. because that's also been a while because that just because i love reading that like actually like okay i'm gonna read a book and like it was hard like i Mm. i had like now i now i'm like back to like my i feel like my spirit my hobbies back where i can actually focus long enough without having to check my phone or you know all the things that come with like electronic devices or just the thing and i'm like Mm -hmm. like this is kind of crazy as an adult as an educator as someone who like reads and researches and does all this stuff like I had a hard time reading for like pleasure for 10 pages. I was like, this is just absolutely bonkers to me. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's just, you know, I, I keep thinking about like, what are those quick wins that we can do for ourselves personally or professionally, you know, to kind of like build those habits that we all know, mm-hmm. but framing it how, you know, whatever it needs to be, you know, to, to, to be better. Totally. Well, I feel like drawing from our friend, James Clare, <laughs> you know, the law of 1% increases is everything. 
what is one tiny thing you can do today that is a step towards where you want to be? And he gives a great example in the book of if you want to be healthy and you want to work out more and you think yoga might be the thing, don't go right to like a hot yoga class, like with a bunch of advanced people, like spend that first, just get a yoga mat and spend every day committing to roll it out. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Roll it out. Maybe you sit on it. Maybe you focus on your breath for a couple minutes. But sure enough, over time, if you just keep doing that, you're going to take the next little step and the next little step. And then he always uses the analogy, you know, of like the plane that takes off in LA and ends up, it's due for New York, but it ends up somewhere totally different. Like over time, it becomes exponential. Mm -hmm. But the hardest part is just allowing yourself the space to say, yes, I'm going to do this. Yeah. But we're such perfectionists, which go oh. back, goes back to the assessment thing, right? Yes. I was the queen of like, how many points away from perfect am I? If I got a 98%, it was a fail. And we do this all the time in our minds where we're like, well, if I'm not going to start yoga and be at the front of the class doing like some advanced move perfectly, then ugh, why bother? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and we just opt yeah. out because we don't want to be seen as less than perfect because we've been so conditioned. And it's, yeah, it's not just school, but I mean, you could argue that that deeper need for sorting and ranking is there across society. And some people will use that as a justification for why we have to keep things the way they are in school, which I always respond with, but why can't we be the space of change? Mm. If education isn't going to be the for the forefront of change, then who is? Yeah. Right. Like, sorry. Yeah. You know, as you're, as you're, as you're saying that you talked yoga and I, I, in my head, this makes sense, but it may not, but I'm going to try to connect yoga to assessment. Um, I'm the same way. Like many moons ago, I used to be quite in shape. And as I have failed time and time again to get in shape, it's because I keep comparing myself to when I was at my peak moment of, mm. of fitness. And I'm like, well, I'm not running that kind of pace. I'm not, you know, screw this. And so I actually, through the 75 hard challenge, I have attempted, and I'm using the literally the word attempted yoga, and I'm doing it in my house hidden away mm -hmm. from all people um because mobility is something i have neglected and like i have a hard time i can barely sit indian style like i mean i'm getting better because i keep practicing it but my point to get to the assessment piece in school is this kind of like one one size fits all approach that mm -hmm. sometimes it's just the pressures of sometimes we haven't changed our ways sometimes there's a curriculum and our hands are tied there's a lot of reasons so i'm not i'm not here to blast teachers on this mm -hmm. statement but like it's here's the method everybody's gonna do this method and we're all gonna be assessed this way mm -hmm. and i'm and i keep thinking about this yoga experience of mine where like i i'm i'm not gonna share me doing yoga because no one no one wants to see that no i don't want to be in a class <laughs> and i don't want to be compared to experts and that would be my own self-judgment not other people yeah. judging but i think about the avenues of playlists or opportunities to showcase learning differently, how we mm -hmm. assess kids, how we assess ourselves, where, you know what, this, it may or may not springboard to me, maybe getting comfortable to be in a class and it might allow me mm -hmm. to go here or go there. But the fact that I have one route being in my living room where only my dog laughed at me, you know, following some instructor on YouTube is the starting point for me, but it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that would be the starting point for you. And so yeah. as you're, your assessment work this is a long circumnavigated <laughs> storyline it's like mm -hmm. i'm trying to relay this idea of like how do we help ourselves teachers that are burned out with grading all the time assessing mm -hmm. everything all the data all the pressure of the system to let some of that go to actually have mm -hmm. better assessment in data and kids mm -hmm. and give them other entry points to truly showcase their learning i mean i know that's yeah. the bulk of your work but I'm trying to segue there because it makes sense in my head like how do we allow get more of those opportunities you know, yeah. in schools? Because if we're not doing it there, it's not going to happen elsewhere. Well, I'm going to give you three dips because I'm going to give you the like <laughs> law of 1% increases, like tiny, tiny, like dip your toe in and then we'll wade in a bit deeper. And then for someone maybe who's further along the path that's listening, I'll give the deep dive and some examples of where it's yeah. happening across America. So the dip your toes in. If you're even curious about rethinking that assessment space and what it could be, ask yourself which tasks or which activities am I willing this week to not grade, mm. but I'm not going to not assess them. So I'm going to choose to not grade them. I'm not going to put a point, a score, anything numerical on it. I'm not going to use a rubric to rank it. I'm going to look at the evidence. I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time truly looking at the evidence, putting them in piles based on what I feel are the things the students are not quite understanding. And I'm going to plan something instructionally around that. That's the time, like, that's a tiny dip your toe in. If you do really need that for a grade, then I would say, give it back to the kids after you've taught and whatever that lesson is based on the evidence you saw 
and have them go back and do some revision and then grade it, that will be the tiniest first step just to see the benefits of that descriptive feedback in absence of a grade, which there's a lot of research that supports. If someone's been playing in that space and they want to go a bit deeper, I would say look at a unit or look at a project. Decide what are the core learning goals. What are the non-negotiable things you want all students to know and be able to do? And name them. Put them out there. We've talked about that's the first step in achieving anything, right? You actually have to name it. Right, <laughs> and, right. And, and declare it. So declare it, share it with the kids, and then hold off assigning those things a grade until the very end and allow them to look across the body of evidence with you and determine what that grade might be. Mm-hmm. That's the next piece. Then if you want to go all in, I mean, there's some schools and districts doing some really cool stuff around like big picture narrative assessment, which has me fired up. Um, obviously high tech high is like one of the meccas of education. Everyone sure. goes there. They've been doing narrative dialogic based assessment for years, but they sometimes are a little out of reach for folks. Right, right. But another district doing really cool work is uh, Jefferson County public schools in Louisville, Kentucky I'm doing mm-hmm. some work with them. So they've just implemented something called the backpack of success skills. So they defined across the district. These are the transferable universal competencies that we want all students to have based on, you know, this body of research that came out in the late nineties, early two thousands about what should be the priorities of education. And there was a huge shift to it's less about knowing things post internet and more about being able to do. Yeah. So they've got their backpack of success skills and then they've actually implemented a defensive learning schedule. So there's one at the end of elementary, one at the end of middle school, one at the end of high school. And then everything leads up to these big moments where the students have these big formal presentations to tell the story over mm-hmm. years of how they've developed these competencies, what evidence they have of that, and to really think about how they tell their story of transformation and change, which which we realized in our book and writing it, that's the heart of leadership. Yeah, A great leader is able to stand up in front of a group of people and say, here's the problem I was facing. Here was a rock bottom moment, but I made this decision. It took me in this direction. Here's how it changed me. I know this is something that is, you're all capable of doing as well, because you're also people who value being the best you can possibly be. And here's what we're going to do. That's leadership. (laughs) So to do that work, and if you don't have the leadership, any advice for educators? Mm. Because I see, like, I I, I can see, and I, like, I don't do assessment work, but I have been to other states and do stuff around STEM and computer science and and AI as a recently. You start to think about the systems and whether you embrace or process at the end of the day, it comes down to does the building or the district have a leader that will allow it to happen? Otherwise, mm-hmm. it kind of comes back to what we talked about earlier. You start to get these martyrs that, that happens yeah. where they believe in the work and they're like, I'm going to do it. And then it starts to become like a us versus them mindset. Oof. And then that's yeah. not good for culture either. But like, what do you do where it's like, this is, I know what, what needs to be done, but mm-hmm. I'm in the system that doesn't allow it. Oh, like, yeah. How do you like, I mean, is it possible? Maybe it's not possible. Or it's like, the most how do you... heartbreaking part of the system. And as someone who's always been a strong believer of ask for forgiveness and not permission, my first advice is do it anyways. Yeah, but be- right? if you know why you're doing it and it's grounded in research validated methods, which everything I just described is, okay, you have concerns right? with it. I hear your concerns. I understand, but this is what I'm doing. I think on in education, we need to get a little bit of swagger back. Yeah. around not letting parents sway the conversation, not letting the media sway the conversation. We are a profession. And if yeah. we want to be treated like professionals, we need to stand in that truth of this is what's truly best, a research validated pathway for kids. And this is what I'm going to be doing. And then when it comes down to negotiating that with the leaders, I always believe, and if you're persistent and you keep hearing no, but you keep moving forward, Eventually it becomes a yes. That's been my career, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, all change comes from persistence. And if you're not actually doing anything different, you're just going to hear yes. Like you're going to hear no if you're trying to do something outside of the status quo. Right. So expect it, be prepared for it, embrace it, keep persisting. However, I would say to anyone who's in that space, if you're in a toxic culture and leadership situation, a bit of resistance and objection is totally normal and natural. Right. If it becomes personal, if they're attacking your character, if they're threatening your job and your security, document it, start recording conversations, and then go to HR right. and stand up for yourself because yeah. that there's no place for that. And I think there is so much abuse that happens in the education system from really poor leadership. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know, I think I, 
I say this jokingly time and time again when I when I work with teachers, but I don't really mean it as a joke. Like if if educators actually like all came together and put their foot down to any kind of policy, whether that's local, state, federal, I mean, it doesn't matter the angle mm -hmm. uh, on things where people are making decisions that don't understand education. Woo, like you don't you don't stop that that bus of awesome. Um nope. it just doesn't happen <laughs> because we're I mean by nature teachers are that they're they're going to avoid the conflict, you know. They want to do what's right. They're going to kind of fit within the mold, and yeah. it's just it's just kind of who you have to be. I think when you not have to be, but it's kind of the DNA sure. of people. No, no, there's a lot of pressure. Kids, right? A I mean, lot of just, pressure. Yeah. So this this is a good segue into when I left my job in you know the spring of 2020. I wanted to do something that was just something that I wanted to create myself. The speaking and the consulting, you know, there's kind of a clear pathway for that. I was recruited by a company called Solution Tree publishing company in the state. So I was partnering with them for professional development work, but I wanted to create something for those people who were trying to lead change inside the system. Cause I know mm. that it can feel lonely. It can feel demoralizing at times and make you even feel like you've lost your sense of like sanity because yeah. everyone's telling you you're wrong. And I was like, they need a community first and foremost. My thinking is the same as yours. I believe in a strength in numbers. You know, one of the number one influences on student achievement is teacher collective efficacy. And that's often done in schools, but in a very like performative, gross way of like, now go right. collaborate and fill in this worksheet. Yep. It's not real. <laughs> but people coming together around a shared vision, you know, we believe that assessment and grading is not where it needs to be for 2023. We are not preparing these students to be the future citizens our society needs to solve the wicked problems that we're facing, to confront things like the global wars that were on the precipice of, to learn how to collaborate. And so if that's the case, we need to come together and it's probably not going to happen in our systems because there's a lot of threats from inside the system. Sure. So I was like, we need to build it outside the system. So I created this thing called the Empowerment Ecosystem. It was an online community and program for folks. Uh, I like to say tugging the thread of assessment and grading and equity. And then that has like now that. grown like into events. So we have two coming up. We have one in April in Calgary, Alberta, and then one in Vancouver uh, in May. So I'll give you a link for that if yeah. people are interested. I won't say much more, but it really is meant to be, let's get those people together who are the change agents on the inside. Let's grow a critical mass and then let's plan together. Let's work together. Let's collaborate. How can we provide proof of concept for each other? How can we help each other with our messaging so it becomes more magnetic for our unique communities? Yeah, so I love that. And, uh, yeah, I've seen I've seen that work online and it looks, it looks incredible. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so great because I do think there's starting to be uh, more backbone, I think, in the education mm -hmm. space of, you know, we know what's best for kids. We being whoever is involved that believes in that message, whether in the classroom or coaches or admin, because there are, there are lots of them out there that, that do know what's best. I think everybody believes we're going to do what's best. I think it's another thing to then move that into action and, and, and do those things and, and maybe not get caught up in a lot of the stuff that gets involved when it comes to curriculum and mm -hmm. systems and all the things that come mm -hmm. with that. Um, so yeah, that would, that would be definitely, we'll, we'll get that linked in there. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as we think about this, um, the last thing that I, that I want to touch upon and then we'll start to wrap up here with some of your, your final thoughts is as, as we think about assessments and all the work that you do, something that I, it seems so obvious, um, but yet I think can get lost again in the nuance of all the things in the system at large of education. But like, and you had a post on this. I know you've got a podcast. This is, I mean, something you have probably talked about 18 million times. That idea that assessment is a process um, and mm -hmm. not just, um, I think in LinkedIn, you called it a packet um, <laughs> or, you know, I always say it's not a product. And I, I yeah. mean, I'm going to come back to the, like this AI world for right now where the panic is on cheating. And my thing is like, what did, you, what did you do with the work along the way? If you yeah. gave a kid an assignment to write a write an essay, for example, this is the easiest one to, to example, and you don't do anything with it and they just turn it in, why would a kid not use AI? And if you haven't mm -hmm. taught them how to use AI to enhance their thinking, then should you fail them? And so this is not necessarily an AI specific question, but I think AI brings this this concept back to the forefront yet again around mm -hmm. assessment and that idea of it's it's a process. It's not just like, here's some stuff that I got to go put into the grade book, which I know is a mandatory thing for lots of us. But I, could you talk a little bit about that? Like, not that, we're, again, we're, we're defining the system, but how do mm -hmm. you play within assessing to really truly understand the skills of kids 
um, throughout the journey and not just like, hey, here's an essay, sit at your desk and get it done. Totally. I think the first thing to recognize is it's it's not really an either or, but more of an expansion of our understanding of assessment that's happened mm-hmm. starting in the mid 90s, definitely right through until today. And because in the 80s and 90s was the introduction of standards in the States or outcomes in Canada into our curriculum. So we raised the standard and the sophistication of what students are expected to know and be able to do rather than just recalling content that was taught. They now had to analyze, they had to solve, they had to evaluate. And so when that happened, there raised a question in education of, well, how do we get them there? And then enter the reemergence of this thing called formative assessment. Well, we can use information to make decisions about where to go next because it's it's a longer journey. Yep. And so that ignited a landslide of research. So I, I say it's an expansion because there is going to always be a need for some kind of artifact of learning. Right. Sure, a physical product might be one of them, but now we can also accept that conversation might be one, observation might be another artifact. But that's kind of like just one small piece of the larger process. Because if you're doing that in isolation, it just becomes the the abstract completion of activities. Mm. But if you just zoom out, and this goes back to our our lack of willingness to reflect, plan, like it's all connected. I truly believe this is all connected. (laughs) You have to step back and say, okay, step one, what is essential for my students to know and be able to do in my class? I have to define it. I have to declare it. It's not going to happen if you don't declare it. That's step one. (laughs) That's a life lesson. (laughs) So you have to declare it. And then you have to think about it. Okay, well, if I I say collaboration in math is the goal, what does that look like? Mm. I have to define what success looks like. And I've got to figure out what are the things I'd need to know and be able to do to get to that level of success? Because we want to have high expectations. There's a big misconception out there that outcomes-based grading or standards-based grading is about watering it down. It's not. It's actually about getting to the higher level of complexity that we're supposed to in our curriculum. So once we've laid that out, that's our architecture. That's the next step of the process. Then we think about, okay, what are the different means of gathering evidence? Those are your artifacts. That's where the product comes into it, but it's not isolated anymore. It has a place. It has a purpose. Then when we get into the journey, we start to get evidence. So we have some decisions to make. Am I going to use this evidence to determine where to go next? Is this valid evidence of what I needed students to know and be able to do? So what do I do when they they have it? What do I do when they don't have it? That's our agility. And then we're getting into feedback. We have to think about, okay, how do we amplify the conversations about learning to keep learning moving forward? This is where we attend to the research of removing grading from that descriptive feedback conversation because Mm -hmm. it's such an undermining force and neutralizes all of the feedback that we're trying to provide. Once all that's said and done, okay, there'll come a moment in time where we're going to verify has learning happened. That might just be looking at the body of evidence we already have. Or it might be doing something else because we're missing something and we're curious. I don't quite understand if they know this yet. So I'm going to ask them or get them to demonstrate it for me. All of that taken together is the foundation of the research for student investment. Yes. If we want students to be agents of their own learning, we have to set up the conditions for them to do so. So the ultimate goal is for students to become assessors on their own behalf, but it requires a little bit of planning, a little bit of front loading, and a little bit of thinking. (laughs) And then we get to the ultimate outcome that we all seek. And that's what I mean when I say it's a process. So it's an expansion. Right. The product is still there, but it's, we have to think a little bit more about this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, you still have that end goal. You still have that end thing that needs to, we need to arrive at, but it's the journey along the way. I think about take a road trip with, with, with my kids, right? Like, I mean, I don't, I mean, I could just redline it straight through, but no, you know, sometimes we got to stop and got to assess the food situation, the bathroom situation, mm-hmm. and a fatigue situation. Like, you know, you're just kind of having it like, you know, so uh, that's probably not the best example to connect <laughs> to the, the more thorough idea you had, but like that idea of like, yeah, it doesn't mean we don't have a product at the end, but like, what are we doing along the way to ensure that when we're at the end, there's, there's mutual understanding whether or not mm-hmm. me as the educator facilitator is like, yes, you've got it. And the kid knows that too, you know, like we're all, we're all in this together and not, yeah. I'm going to turn something in and I'm going to wait to maybe see if I got it or not. Like we should, we should all kind of know by that point if we've have the artifacts and have mm-hmm. the collection or the backpack uh, with, with the school yeah. that you're kind of thinking through to kind of defend that learning. So that's, yeah. that's awesome. And it all starts. What do you want students to know and be able to do? That would be the first step I'd suggest to anyone listening. If you haven't done that work in your course or in your space or in your department, have that conversation, map it out, give yourself a goal of I'm not going to have any more than you know, seven to 10 goals, like core essential things that a lot of your other standards or outcomes would collapse into. But 
name it. Yeah. <laughs> a great example of this, there's a book called Pointless written by Sarah M. Zerwin. She's a high school English teacher in Colorado. And she did this with her course. And the way she drafted like what is English is like gives you goosebumps when you read it. Mm. Like she says to kids on day one, the purpose of this course is not just to get a mark in English. The purpose of this course is to read your world so you can write your life within it mm. right off the hop. And then she says, and here's how we're going to do that. Boom, her learning goals. And wow. they're crafted. They're like, I have goosebumps just thinking about it. Yeah. Like you want, this is like marketing 101, like know your audience, know them as human beings and talk to them in a way that's deeper than just let's play the game of school. Right. Do this. Otherwise you'll get a zero. Do it because it's on the test. Like that's not motivating to anybody. No, <laughs> I don't no. like being coerced into doing things. No, no. Yeah. No. Well, I'm going to have to add that book to my list. I feel like mm. that's a, another one to, uh, I, I need so to good. explore. I have not heard of that. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. you sharing that. Yeah. Well, I want to be respectful of time um, and I want to go full circle with the story and, and who you are. I can't thank you enough for, for sharing all that you have. And so part of my, I'm not really a revamp, but my uh, expansion, I'm going to use your <laughs> word, um, is I want to end the podcast with, with two questions or ideas from you um, mm -hmm. and we you can take it however you want. First one is, as we think about all the stuff we've talked about today and your own journey, you know, what is the best piece of advice um, that you've ever received? Ooh. Put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Change is more emotional than clinical. Hmm. Yeah. I was told no. that early on by a mentor in my leadership journey. Wow. Um, true for when we're leading change, true for ourselves too. And it goes back to everything we've talked yeah. about in this episode, right? Wow. It's just such a deep truth. We think we can strategize our way through everything, right, <laughs> but we're right. much more emotional than that. <laughs> I know. And I still, I, that is, uh, I fail at that. I think I can like, my analytical brain can analyze everything. And sometimes it's, oh, you yeah. just can't, you can't do that for everything. You just gotta like. <laughs> and beware anyone who says they operate from logic alone. Like yeah, put some right, boundaries in right. place because yeah, they're going to yeah. harm you. <laughs> 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 I love that. And so the last thing is rant or rave. And this doesn't have to be about anything we've oh. talked about. But if you've got something, an idea we didn't talk about, a book, a movie, something in society, in the news, whatever, it doesn't matter. I'll give you a chance to kind of just share something of the human side of, of Natalie here that you want to rant or rave about. So I'm going to give you the final thing that will let people know where yes. they can, can find you and follow. I know exactly what my answer is to this um, because I was indulging in this last night and I was so excited I had to jump off of my couch and take like one of those victory laps around the living room because I loved it so much. Um, but it's a series on Disney Plus called The Bear. Oh. oh my gosh. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, my friends recommended it to me and I've been binging it over the past week. I'm now deep into season two. It is such a beautiful masterclass in family, in the idea of craft and that we all strive for high expectations when we're in the conditions to do so. Close notes is it's about a brother who moves home. He's like a Michelin star chef in New York, but his brother has passed away. So he moves home to take over his brother's restaurant and inherit all of the kooky characters yes. <laughs> that are oh within my gosh. it. That's yeah. basically all you need to know. <laughs> and and talk about that show is literally living on the edge of chaos, that family yeah. day. <laughs> oh, the first episode, I was like, I have so much anxiety. I texted my friends. I'm like, why are they all yelling? They're like, just get through the first few episodes. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Yep. My mom who loves TV, she's like, I can't watch it. It's just too much. It's, 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 it's too it's much for pretty me. pretty chaotic. But, it, yeah. but like, yeah. but I'm telling people, if you start oh. it based on this recommendation, hang on because the arc that the characters go through is like, it will just bring you to your knees. It's so beautiful. Uh, yes. I, I will give two thumbs up to that recommendation. I am a diehard, uh, fan of that show for sure so Excellent. that's awesome well Nada, <laughs> this has been absolutely gosh incredible thank you for like talking assessments and i think i got a therapy session out of that as well in there too so i, 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 I appreciate uh, the double whammy of, of 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 growth and learning you know for those that haven't been following your journey and they want to know more which i i have no doubt they will you know what are some of the the best places for them to to reach out connect and uh see what you got cooking mm -hmm. especially i'll get all the links to the show notes people know but uh you know we're the best places two instagram spaces that i am creating and talking about the work and education are twitter and instagram so both at the same handle nata basso and the podcast would probably be the more in-depth way to follow along and see what i'm up to and what i'm thinking uh, so the podcast is called Edu Crush. It's kind of like a play on words. It's like, you know, I have an edu crush on you and we're going to crush it together. So that is on whichever platform you listen to podcasts. That'd be the main ways. 
Sweet. Well, thank you so much, my friend, for this conversation. It's been uh, such a pleasure to actually like have a verbal exchange uh, with you <laughs> and not just through, through yeah. messages and connections. Take it so, off the LinkedIn comments. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you for uh, carving out some time. It's greatly appreciated. Oh, it was my pleasure. This was such a great conversation. Thanks, Erin. Hey, 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 y'all. Woke up at six o'clock in the morning, chilling with coffee mugs, me and coffee chugs, talking education all across the nation, pushing boundaries, thinking innovation. Hey, 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 chaos.